Good evening, everybody. Hello, welcome to our live deep sky tour uh, from McDonald Observatory. My name is Stephen Hummel. Uh, I'm going to be our telescope operator tonight, and I'm joined tonight by Saul Rivera. Hello, Saul. Hi, Stephen. Okay. Um, so, welcome everyone to our live stream. We are coming to you from far west Texas. Uh, McDonald Observatory is located in far west Texas. We're part of the University of Texas at Austin, but we're not located in Austin. Um, we're off in the, uh, the mountains in far west Texas where the skies are oh so dark. Uh, we have some of the darkest skies of any major research observatory in the United States. Um, that's in part due to our remote location and also in part due to the fact that we work with the surrounding communities uh, to help preserve our dark skies. So tonight's program is largely going, going to be kind of a, a celebration of our night sky. Um, after, uh, actually starting tomorrow is International Dark Sky Week. So expect lots of other activities from around the world celebrating our night sky. Um, but tonight we're going to be showcasing a few objects uh, that can be appreciated under uh, your sky, whether that be in the city or rural area, um, as well as some objects that can only really be fully appreciated under a dark night sky like we have here. Um, but uh, yeah, again, we're located in uh, in West Texas, and also here in West Texas with me is Saul Rivera. Yeah, thank you, Steven. Yeah, so right now where we're actually located on site at McDonald Observatory, well, for me, I'm currently at home, and Steven, you might have noticed, his camera looks kind of weird. He looks like he's stuck in like before color was invented. But right now he's basically using the infrared camera so we actually can see him because he is currently inside the one of the domes in our telescope park behind our visitor center. So he's in there with the with a telescope behind him, our 16 inch reflecting telescope, which is pictured here more in detail. You can see Stephen kind of pointing it behind him. And this image kind of shows it a bit more easily. You can actually see it more be a bit better. And if you're curious about what kind of camera we're using for the images tonight, which is attached to the telescope, or the specifications of the telescope, we do have those details down in the description. Also throughout tonight's program, if you have any questions or any or any remarks, feel free to drop them in the chat. We also have mods on the chat in the chat that will answer any questions that pop up. And if not, they will forward it to us. So Stephen and I can answer those questions. Now, before we actually kind of go into some of the stuff we'll be seeing tonight, we do want to mention something you might be able to see tomorrow night. Well, at least a peak of it. The Lyrids Meteor Shower. So this meteor shower is kind of near the constellation of Lyra and Hercules. And will peak around for our time zone a little bit after midnight. You'll be able to see about 5 to 10 per hour. And the darker the skies, the more of them you'll see. And also there'll be some moonlight, so you won't be able to see that much, but still darker the skies, the better. Also throughout the program, you'll be seeing screenshots such as these. And this screenshot is from a software called Stellarium. So that's a free software that can, it's free on PC, Mac, Linux, and basically works as a map of the sky. You can go to specific dates, see how this night sky, what constellations will be visible during that night, and even look for specific objects. And speaking of kind of like the night sky and such, how is a night sky for tonight, Stephen? Uh, yeah, so tonight we've got a wonderfully clear sky. This is an all sky camera view from uh, here. This is live updating uh, every, every few seconds. You can see that in the counter in the lower left. Um, so uh, we can see it's not quite dark yet. We still got a little bit of light on our western horizon, but the stars are starting to pop out um, and not a cloud to be seen, uh, which is great news for us. Uh, there's an, uh, you know, a small chance we may see a few meters. They may you know, uh, pop up on this camera. So we'll check back on this live view of the All Sky camera at a few points throughout the program. Um, again, the peak of the Lyrid meteor shower isn't really till the morning. Uh, and, uh, you know, there will be a moon up at that time, but uh, we may still get a few. Um, they can happen at any time of the night and any location of the night. Uh, so maybe we'll get lucky. But yeah, great skies tonight and 
great weather. It's a really comfortable um, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, actually kind of warm for us. Yeah. All right. Then to start us off for tonight, we're going to, since it's still pretty bright out, we're going to start with a calf bright object. A star by the name of Betelgeuse. Or some people say Betelgeuse, but if you say the name three times, bad things may happen. So we'll stick with Betelgeuse. So Betelgeuse is a super red giant star about 640 light years away, located in the constellation of Orion. More specifically, Orion's shoulder. So this so this star is actually pretty easily visible. Even if you're in the city, you might be able to see this star with relative ease. You might even be able to notice pretty easily the color it has. It's kind of a reddish star. And that can tell us a lot about the star itself. And, and we can actually get a pretty nice look of it, up close look with our telescope. So is that view ready, Stephen? Yes, it is. All right, so here's a live view of Betelgeuse from the 16-inch telescope behind me. Um, you may see it shimmer a little bit. Uh, again, it's a live video, basically, of the star. Uh, those spikes are an artifact of the design of the telescope. They're called diffraction spikes. Uh, but uh, Betelgeuse, uh, again, is uh, famous for being uh, one of the brighter stars in Orion. So regardless of where you are, there's a good chance that uh, you could see this in your night sky. Don't really need any special equipment like we have. It's not definitely not necessary to see it, but it helps. Um, and if you can find it in your sky, then compare its color that you see naked eye with some of the other stars around it. And you may notice Betelgeuse has that orangey yellow color to it. Um, and as Saul mentioned, that's because Betelgeuse is a red supergiant. So uh, what that means is this is a very massive star, um, at least 10 times the mass of the sun, likely more, which is much bigger than the average star. Uh, and when very large stars, very massive stars, begin to run out of fuel later in their lifespans, they begin to expand, puff up. They kind of expand, blow off their outer layers a bit to form, in this case, this current stage, a red supergiant. And the reason for the color is because as the outer layers of that star expand, those outer layers get further from the core where the heat is generated. And so the outer layers are cooler comparatively. So the outer layers, as they cool down, change in appearance. The hotter they are, the more blue they appear. And the cooler they are, the more yellow or red they appear. So, given the color, you can guess that this is a, a relatively cooler star, since it's kind of a yellowish color. Um, Betelgeuse is uh, about 650 light years away, and it's still one of the brighter stars in the sky, which, which is quite remarkable. Um, and that's it's just a testament to how luminous it is as a star. The bigger, the more massive the star, the brighter it is. Um, but late in life, as they run out of fuel, the outer layers cool down. It's probably got another 100,000 years or so before it's basically out of energy entirely. It collapses on itself uh, and explodes into supernova. We'll get into what a supernova looks like uh, later on in another object. Um, but again, about 100,000 years or so, give or take a few. I hope we're wrong because it'd be really cool to see that in the night sky. Um, but again, yeah. That, yeah, that'd be neat. Uh, we don't have to worry about it because it's far enough away. It would just look really neat. But uh, back to this color. So again, it's got this sort of yellowish color. Uh, and you can gauge roughly the temperature of a star just by looking at its color. Um, and you may actually be familiar with this, this concept if you've ever been to a hardware store and looked at a light bulb on the, in its box. Looking at the back of the box, you probably saw a number describing the color of that light bulb. And that number was maybe something like 4,000 Kelvin, 5,000 Kelvin, something like that. And that refers to the Kelvin temperature scale. Uh, this is something actually light bulbs and uh, stars kind of use the same scale in a sense. Um, now, when, if, when we're talking about a light bulb, we don't mean that the light bulb itself is 5,000 Kelvin, which would be, you know, like nearly 9,000 Fahrenheit. Kelvin, if you're unfamiliar, it's basically the same as Celsius, but the uh, zero is 
absolute zeros, cold as can be. So if you're if you're confused, Kelvin is the same as Celsius. Just add 273 degrees, and there that's the difference between them. Um, so our sun, the temperature of our sun is around 6,000 Kelvin, white. Um, and when you go to a hardware store and you pick out a light bulb that says daylight white, it will say the color it, temperature is 6,000 Kelvin. So the idea of color temperature is if you were to heat something up, physically just a lump of whatever, and get it really hot, the color it glows is basically corresponding to this temperature. So in a star, because it, the hotter the star, the more blue it's going to emit. Um, so for a very bright, super luminous blue star, you might get all the way up to 10,000 Kelvin or more, which is a very blue color. In the case of Betelgeuse, actually, I'm going to let you guys kind of guess. You know, let's, let's look back at Betelgeuse here. Look at that color. Sort of a yellowy color. It's not quite red. We we'll call it a red supergiant, but we're kind of stretching that a little bit. Sort of yellowish color. Where, how hot then do you think Betelgeuse is, just based on the color and this chart? I'll give you a second yeah, to think feel about free it. To, yeah, yeah, feel free to drop in the chat your guesses. Yeah. So, you know, given that it's, it looks sort of uh, yellowish, it's a good bet that it's going to be on the left side of the chart. And in fact, it's about 3,500 Kelvin. That is the surface temperature of Betelgeuse. Uh, and you can find much cooler stars going down to 1,000 Kelvin. If you find uh, light bulbs or something, you may find, on average, they're around, like an incandescent light bulb is 2,700 Kelvin in its color temperature. Again, doesn't mean the light bulb is actually that hot. It's just kind of mimicking that. So, um, yeah, it, it, you may be wondering, okay, if, if the sun is... 6,000 Kelvin, why does it look yellow in the sky? Well, that's because our atmosphere changes the color. Uh, when we look at the sun in the sky, then don't look directly at it, uh, probably learned that, um, but the sun is often depicted as yellow because our atmosphere changes the color. The air around us scatters the blue light out. And that's what why the sky is blue. And the yellow and red colors kind of are scattered less so they actually make it through more that's why sunsets are so red uh the, the blue is all scattered away that's also why uh, around observatories uh, out here to protect the night sky we prefer colors that are in kind of 2000 3000 range or below uh, because we want to avoid blue if we use a blue light at night much of the blue light's going to scatter and wash out the stars just like sunlight does in the daytime all right, uh, so I'm going to head on over to our next target. So back to you. Yeah, so our next target, so Betelgeuse was a single star. But what about a group of stars, a group of young stars we call an open cluster? This specific one called NGC 2158. Sadly, it doesn't really have a fancier name than that. And this is an open cluster about 11,000 light years away from us, near the right feet of Gemini. Now, if any of you are amateur astronomers and looked near this area, you might have noticed another open cluster, one called M35. If you've seen it, feel free to drop into the chat if you've seen it before or not. And this cluster is pretty large and can actually be seen with the naked eye on very, very dark nights. NGC 2158 is actually right next to it. And when I mean right next to it, it's literally almost right next to it, at least from our perception in the night sky. And just from this image, you can tell there's some differences. M35 seems to be a lot larger, a lot more spread out. All the stars appear to be bluer. While NGC 2158 seems a bit more compact almost, and the stars seem a bit more yellow. So M35 have stars that are a lot younger. They're about 175 million years old. That's a lot for us, but not for a star. To put into perspective, if these stars were people, they'd be kids a little under two years old or so. So kind of like a little stellar daycare going on there. And you see 2158, though, are very old for a stellar nursery. And then I was scratching. No, I mean, so I meant to say open cluster. Very old for an open cluster. About 2 billion years old. 
and we'll be looking at Angie C2158. Now to see this cool color temperature, these pretty old stars are still in their daycare, basically in their 20s. But also M35 is just too big in the night sky for us to get in just one single field of view. And with that, and uh, Steven, is M35 ready? Uh, not M35, but 21, NGC 2158. Yep, NGC, yeah, yeah. Yep, NGC 2158. Yeah, M35 little more compact uh, brother. Um, so yeah, again, if you've seen M M35, let us know in the chat. And also let us know if you've spotted its fainter little companion nearby. The um, Yeah, again, this is a, a an open cluster. So uh, in this case, uh, still sort of young, 2 billion years old. I wouldn't say that's super old, but it's kind of, yeah, young adult, uh, middle-aged for some of these stars. And, and you can definitely notice that um, they are faint, uh, and they are kind of orangey-red color. Um, there's a few brighter ones scattered around, but um, the core of the cluster around here, definitely dominated by slightly orange-colored stars. So probably cooler than our sun for sure, on average. Most of them would be. Um, this cluster is 11,000 light years away. And now compared to a lot of the other open clusters that are up at this time of year, and there are many, that is actually pretty far. So you need a sizable telescope and pretty dark skies in order to see it, in part because the stars are dimmer, and they're older, uh, and because it is also far away, and because it's pretty small. So it's a, it's a tougher object to spot in an amateur telescope, but it is still possible. Whereas its bigger brother, M35, is pretty easy by comparison. Um, but again, this is NGC 2158. I think it deserves a better nickname, you know, uh, instead of just a catalog name. Um, something better than just yeah. 35's little brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so we've got... Uh, I'm going to bring out the exposure a little bit as... As we're watching, we're actually adding more exposures um, to to it, stacking them is what we call it. So as we watch, the image will slowly improve the longer we watch. Um, all right. Let's see, uh, I'm gonna look at um, look at our our full sky view for a moment here. Uh, just pop on over to that. You can see the stars are starting to come out a little more. Um, can also maybe tell Orion is just sitting down over here. Uh, and Betelgeuse, we looked at or just a minute ago, is, is visible. Um, but yeah, it's starting to get dark. Uh, you can see the camera refreshing. Uh, no meteors yet, but uh, we're going to keep watching. All right, so back to you. I'm going to move on to our next target. Yeah, so Cav, before we Cav leave uh, M35's little brother, Completely away. We do have a longer exposure image of NGC 2158, actually taken by Steven as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, Cav, with here, you can see a lot more clearly the colors in there, a lot more orange yellow stars. See, they're a lot more compact. Usually, what happens in these systems as time goes on, they drift away from one another and basically finish making their own systems. Basically, their solar systems are base are practically done. They're just adding the finishing details, like a little moon here and there. But these are have had them done basically for a while. And next, we're going to see is so we're kind of continuing going back. We're going to see an even younger star, or better yet, an area with a younger star. We're going to be looking at NGC twenty two sixty one also known as Hubble's Variable Nebula. So this nebula is about 2,500 light years away from us, near the left feet of Gemini. So the reason this is called Hubble's Variable Nebula is that Edwin Hubble actually took an image of this nebula through the Palomar Observatory Hell Telescope, and actually the telescope's first light, which means basically the first night it was open. And this object is kind of as we look at it, there's going to be lots of clouds. So a nebula is basically a large group of gas and dust that's in space. When the star is inside it, it can illuminate that cloud of gas. 
sometimes some of the images we see are new stars being born inside the clouds. Others is the star that died and the leftover core is illuminating the gas around it. In this case, gas, the light, star's light is reflecting off of it, giving it this appearance. Let's see, it seems we got something appearing. Is the the Hubble variable nebula ready, Stephen? Uh, yes, it is. All right, here we go. Right. So again, Hubble's variable nebula. Um, so this is a rather, yeah, unusual object. Um, as Saul mentioned, it's called Hubble's after Edwin Hubble, who did a lot of work uh, researching this object. Um, and that's the same guy the Hubble Space Telescope was named after. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but the variable part is because this object changes in appearance. Um, so if you've looked at it before, it's worth checking up on it, you know, a few months or, or years later and seeing if it's changed. That is kind of unusual because usually in when we're talking about deep sky objects, um, over thousands or millions of years, they may appear to change, but not really on a human time scale. Whereas this does appear to change in just a few days, weeks, or, or months. That's subtle. It's not going to change right now as we're watching it, but it is noticeable if you were to look back again later on. So um, a nebula, again, just means cloud. Um, in this case, that cloud is mostly made out of hydrogen, helium, carbon, oxygen, uh, lots of other stuff, both atomic and molecular form. And in clouds like this, we have uh, oftentimes new stars, young stars forming inside of it. And that's the case with the central star right here. Uh, it's a newly formed, you know, just you know, maybe a few million years old, if that, uh, star. And it's still enshrouded in that cloud. As stars get older, their heat and energy often pushes away the dust, kind of clearing its neighborhood. Uh, the dust disperses or it's absorbed in stars. So after a while, again, this would eventually just kind of result in an open cluster. But this is still very young. So at the moment, just a little bit of light is leaking out basically of the cloud. So the reason why it's variable is because around this star, there is still gas and dust kind of moving around. And it will change how much light it's blocking as it moves and orbits and does various things around it. So that's going to influence basically the pattern of light that escapes uh, the cloud. So um, to make an analogy, basically, to to kind of uh, grasp what we're seeing, um, let's say we are looking at a typical light fixture. Uh, we have an unshielded light in a shielded example here. On the unshielded one, just imagine that's a typical star. It's shining light in all directions. So if you look straight at it, you just kind of get a bunch of glare. Um, so a lot of that light is just going every which way. Uh, some of it's going down, but also a lot of it's going up. A Hubble's variable nebula is kind of like a shielded light source. The light is enshrouded such that a light is only allowed to escape in one particular direction. Uh, and we're seeing kind of the, the, the light cone reflecting off of the dust. And that is why uh, it has that sort of pattern. And we look back at the real, the real thing, it's kind of like a shielded light fixture. Um, but again, in terms of uh, preserving our night sky, uh, we definitely prefer shielded lights because not only do they not waste energy, but they keep the light where you actually need it, where you're trying to see uh, on the ground. Um, in terms of nebula, it also just looks cool, I think, to have a kind of partially shielded and shrouded uh, star like this, creating this pattern. Yeah, it almost looks like a comet almost. Yeah, it's a it's a good point. It, a lot of people, um, when they first see this, especially if they don't know about it, uh, if they just kind of stumble upon it, they think, oh, I found a comet. Um, because, frankly, if you've never seen a comet before in a telescope, uh, a good one, an interesting one at least, it looks a lot like this. Um, you know, it's you'd have a bright uh, nucleus of the comet and typically two tails. Uh, and maybe some stuff between them as well. So just by pure chance, but complete coincidence, it, it looks sort of like a comet, even though it's unrelated entirely. 
Yeah. Yeah, and we actually have a, a longer exposure view of it. An image actually also yeah. taken by Steven. Flipped around yes. as... as uh, obviously, there's no up and down in space, so uh, you, it's kind of arbitrary. But uh, yeah, it's just flipped upside down in that case. Yeah, you can definitely see a lot more of the dust surrounding it. Uh, you can kind of see around it, the the bright portion of the nebula. There is a sort of very gentle, darker uh, zone where it's sort of obscuring starlight. Yeah, it almost looks more of like that shielded light, almost like it's pointing almost downwards. So you can see more of the edges. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, it really does look like that. All right. Uh, I'm going to move on to our, our next target, but uh, I'm going to check back up on the full sky view first because it's almost 100% dark now. Ooh. Leave that up for a little while. If you've got any questions for us, again, you're welcome to ask that at any time. Um, next target's going to take a, a little bit longer for me to set up. Uh, that's yeah. Okay. Yeah, so a question that came in from Tiffany Gardner. What type of telescope is best for seeing the details of stars? So with some with when you want to like just look at the night sky with a telescope, stars in general, you can even actually use binoculars. Actually, something we recommend sometimes is just when you're in a dark area and just want to look around, a pair of binoculars can help you see a lot. You can see even see some star clusters with binoculars. And in terms of telescope sizes, the larger the telescope is, the more you'll be able to see. In astronomy, we think of telescope mirrors and lenses to be like buckets. The bigger the bucket, the more rain you can catch. The bigger the mirror the lens, the more light you can get. The more light you can get, the farther away you can see, and more detail you can get. So looking at stars in general, there probably isn't a specific one in terms of the details you want to see bigger the telescope, more you can see. Basically, probably a four inch, six inch telescope could work very well if that's what you want to look at. And again, even with just simple binoculars, you can see some pretty cool details and some stars and star clusters. And next we're going to switch over to actually another nebula. And this one actually has a pretty fun uh, one. Actually, I this is the one I like the name the most out of our targets tonight. The Jellyfish Nebula, or its official name, IC443. So the Jellyfish Nebula is actually a supernova remnant, what's left over when the star blows up, basically. It's okay about 4,900 light years away from us and Gemini's right leg. And the way these form is, so as Stephen mentioned earlier, at the center, the core of the star, the energy, the heat is being produced. This is produced through a process we call nuclear fusion. At the star's core, atoms are fusing together into heavier elements, usually hydrogen into helium. The more massive stars are, the heavier the elements that can be fused. Hydrogen to helium, helium to carbon, carbon to oxygen just keeps on going. At a certain point, these fusions are so energetic, the star can't contain anymore. And expands really rapidly, basically almost looking like it's blowing up as it shoots out all of the material away, the gas, all of its outer, all of its layers. It sends that flying to the edges, and to the left or core of the star can still illuminate the gas that was shot away from it, creating a supernova remnant, or in this case, the one we know as the Jellyfish Nebula. And for something like this, you need very dark skies because this thing is actually pretty faint. Even if you know where to look at with a telescope, if you're somewhere with too much light pollution, you'll more than likely not be able to see it. And let's see, is the jellyfish ready to swim into view? <laughs> it's Yeah, it's, it's uh, slowly coming into view. So here we go. So again, the Jellyfish Nebula is uh, probably the faintest object we're going to look at tonight. Um, it's very faint. Uh, and in fact, um, I would say that uh, even under really dark skies, if you were to look at this uh, with an ordinary telescope visually, just your eyeball, you probably would see almost nothing. Um, you would see the stars, but you wouldn't see this sort of faint red shape we have appearing before us. 
And uh, as we stack exposures, add more exposures, it will slowly become more uh, clear. Uh, and I may, just, I'm just going to try uh, fiddling with the settings, seeing if I can adjust the contrast just a little more, Boop. and uh, seeing if I can bring it help bring it out a little bit, because um, it is yeah getting a little on the fainter side. Uh, low contrast, but it's going to come out. But we, you can kind of see uh, a um, that sort of pattern there They're coming out of a thin sort of lace-like appearance stretching across the whole screen. In fact, the object is bigger than the field of view of the telescope here. It's actually quite large, uh, bigger than the full moon in the sky uh, in terms of area. So it's pretty big. Um, it's located about 5,000 light years away. And what we're really seeing here is like the shock wave from that supernova encountering interstellar material. Most of the material is just kind of already out there hanging around hydrogen atoms and stuff. And then they got slammed and heated up by that shock wave and excited to emit this red light from ionized hydrogen. Now, when we're talking about stars, you can infer the temperature based on the color. But when we're talking about gases and ionized materials and stuff, that's not quite as true. Um, you can't really just assume the temperature just by the color in terms of a cloud of material. Um, kind of in the same way that you can't, that a light bulb may be uh, bright blue, but it doesn't mean it's 10,000 Kelvin and would you know melt your house. Um, so yeah, again, it, it only applies really to stars, like that color trick. Uh, but it is red from ionized hydrogen atoms. And again, slowly becoming a little more obvious the longer we watch. Try to bring it out a little more. Definitely has a really beautiful kind of uh, um, thin, wispy structure. If we were to check back on this nebula in a few thousand years, it would probably be bigger. It would. Uh, that shock wave is continuing to expand outwards uh, at incredibly fast speeds. Um, but the supernova that caused this uh, this uh, shock wave um, probably occurred many tens of thousands of years ago. Now, tens of thousands of years is a long time for us, but in space, that's not really all that long ago. Um, that's actually relatively recent. Um, so as years go by, this will slowly expand off, fade away almost completely. And then some of the material what, uh, that was ejected in that explosion may get recycled to form new stars and new planets and stuff. That's actually where some of the elements around you right now came from, including many of the heavier elements on the periodic table, which we often use in everyday life, were formed most likely in supernovas or their aftermath. Yeah, like gold, for example. If you want to be really fancy, you can give someone something like a gold watch and be like, I gift you something created by an exploding star. And you would be accurate. <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. Uh, we've got a deeper uh, exposure of uh, the Jellyfish Nebula. And you can see kind of a little better here why it gets its name. It's got a bright kind of curved section and then fainter tendrils stringing behind it, kind of giving it a jellyfish sort of appearance. Um, this is a five hour exposure. I think the Jellyfish Nebula is a good example of a target that really can only be appreciated fully with telescopes and modern cameras, long exposure photography. Again, if you were to look at this area with a, with a, without a telescope, you would see nothing. And even with a telescope, you would struggle to see anything. Um, so, But with the magic of cameras and telescopes to gather lots of light, and especially dark skies, we can bring out incredibly faint things. There's really almost no limit, uh, practically speaking, to uh, what you can bring out. The longer you gather light and then combine it into an image, the fainter and fainter things you can bring out. And the, the, the more practical limitation is your, you know, how much time you have and kind of your budget for equipment, really. That's really the only thing that's holding you back. Astronomers are going to continue to build larger, er, larger telescopes to see fainter and fainter things exposed longer and longer. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of people also ask, like, okay, yeah, cameras, they have that magic trick where they, where they gather a lot more light than our eyes could ever see. So obviously, 
we see lots of photos of the night sky. Uh, are they realistic? Well, it, I would say yes and no. It depends on, you know, what that photographer did and if they photoshopped it, et cetera, et cetera. But generally speaking, cameras just don't work like our eyes do. So you're never going to see a picture that perfectly mimics what the human eye sees. Um, but, you know, in terms of is trying to recreate some of that effect, in terms of the amount of detail, at least you can see, this is kind of an approximation. Just looking up at the night sky, at the Milky Way, at the brightest portion of the Milky Way, we'll call the summer Milky Way, um, you can see a fair amount of stuff. I think the contrast got a little shifted, but actually I see it on this screen. But um, uh, but yeah, kind of, I don't know, somewhere in the conversion uh, to slides, it, the contrast value got weird, but that's fine. The amount of detail uh, you can see with the naked eye is obviously less than you can see with pictures. And also with the naked eye, looking up, you cannot really perceive the color in the sky. But that's not to say that the color isn't real. The cameras show it. Um, so both of these things are you know, kind of real. Uh, it's just how you perceive the light. When you, especially when you look at an image on a computer screen, because that screen is backlit and glowing, it, it, you're kind of limited in the experience you get. Um, whereas standing under a real starry sky, uh, it, it's very different. It's, it's, um, in fact, I think a lot of people are surprised at how bright a, a naturally dark sky is because under really uh, pristine conditions, Venus is bright enough to cast a shadow. Um, you can actually just kind of find your way around just by starlight if you let your eyes adjust. So it's not like the sky is totally inky black, like this picture kind of makes it seem, you know, aside from the Milky Way. Uh, there is, there's actually just a natural sort of glow to the night sky. Um, but, but speaking of that sky, let's check back on our, our all sky view here and uh, see how it's doing. Uh, maybe we'll catch a meteor or two, we'll, who knows. But right now we can see uh, it's it's getting almost totally dark. It's basically totally dark now, uh, and we can see that there is a um, the faint band of the winter Milky Way, which is the faintest portion of it, barely visible across the sky here, as well as a faint band over here, uh, especially brighter here and kind of shooting up into the sky. That is called the zodiacal light. That's light scattered off of dust in our solar system from the sun. So uh, kind of rare to see that. Uh, I think most people um, aren't aware that they've seen it, if they have, or what really what they're seeing. But yeah, zodiacal light, pretty neat. Oh, it looks like we got a little trail there. I don't know if that's a meteor or a satellite. Could be either one. If we see it in the next frame, it's a satellite. If it disappears. It's probably a meteor. But yeah, we may have gotten something there. Uh, well, not coming from the right direction to be a Lyrid, though. So, hmm, not, yeah, maybe not. It's also a, a time we see tend to see a lot of satellites just after sunset. Okay, I'm going to move on to our next target. Um, I'm going to leave this screen up for you. So, all right, here we go. You are muted, so. Thank you, sorry about that. Well. <laughs> yeah, so we will see a bit, see once it refreshes, see if this is actually a satellite or if we actually saw a meteor going through. But while we can't wait for that to refresh, our next object is a real hoot. It's the <laughs> Owl Nebula, M97. Also, it seems to tr it did disappear yep. looks like unless it's going upwards it's going up i that's a satellite oh yeah, uh, yeah a satellite. so it's a satellite Bomber. oh well <laughs> oh well well to actually switch back to where the owl nebula is m97 is about 2600 light years away from us in the constellation of ursa major so you a lot of you may not have seen the full constellation of ursa major but they have seen one part that makes up makes up makes it up the Big Dipper. If you've seen the Big Dipper before, that is part of the constellation of Ursa Major, the Big Bear. And kind of speaking of the picking out the owl and the owl nebula, a really interesting thing that goes on is that 
birds actually use the night sky to navigate. They have actually have done studies on this. They actually have, even there was a study done on indigo buntings, which is a type of bird that actually goes through Texas for migration, using, recognizing the patterns in the night sky of the Orion constellation. They put them into a planetarium, then they flipped the constellation of Orion, and the bird's orientation also flipped 180 degrees, showing that they know the night sky and can follow the patterns. And this can help a lot for navigations. The one that humans use most for navigation is the star Polaris. So you can actually use the Big Dipper constellation to kind of point you towards Polaris. The outer rim of the Big Dipper kind of bucket can act as a pointer to Polaris. You just follow that line to the bright star, and it'll take you to Polaris. And the cool thing about Polaris, as the night goes on, it looks like it stays still while everything else is moving around it. So as a human, you can use this as a nice point of reference to know the general idea of where north is. And birds can also use this. When you think of birds migrating, we usually think of them just migrating throughout the daytime, such as this image here of some birds over the Rio Grande, kind of taken by Stephen. But birds actually do most of their navigation at night. As you can see, the sun is kind of setting in this image. The majority of bird migrations happens during nighttime. So this is actually a map of the predicted migration of birds for later tonight, basically going a bit past midnight. The yellowish, orangish areas are places where there's a lot of birds. As you can see, despite it being past midnight, it's pretty, there, there's a lot of birds there, a lot of birds going through and using that night sky to navigate their way across the US. Though light pollution does interfere with these flights. Birds, as light pollution increases, the amount of the sky that the birds can see decrease, and certain points with high amounts of light pollution, it can actually disorient birds and disorient them so badly at times they can actually crash into buildings. Actually, according to the American Bird Conservancy, there's about 300 million to 1 billion birds that die each year due to colliding into buildings just in the U.S. And this image here was actually taken by the Fatal Light Awareness Program in Toronto, Canada. Large amounts of light pollution can interfere with the migration patterns of birds and leads to many of their deaths. And something that's actually going on, at least here in Texas, it's Lights Out Texas. Well, we have the idea of this is from April 22nd to May 12th during the peak migration season of birds from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. Turn out, turn, turn off unnecessary outdoor lighting, decrease the light pollution and help the birds get to where they ha are going a lot more safely. And kind of going back to the, the birds is the our big owl in the sky ready? <laughs> Yes, it is. Yeah. Speaking of birds at night, here is the Owl Nebula, uh, another fainter object. But this one is possible to see uh, with an amateur telescope and dark skies. Um, the Owl Nebula is uh, a, an example of a planetary nebula. Uh, and what that really means is that uh, it is a star that was once sort of similar to our sun, that has run out of fuel. Not a big one like Betelgeuse. Big stars like Betelgeuse go supernova and form things like the Jellyfish Nebula. Smaller stars like our sun, when they die, uh, they puff up, expand, but they don't explode. They just slowly blow away about half of their mass or so into space to form uh, these kinds of objects. Uh, again, called planetary nebula. Early astronomers thought they had something to do with planets, but we now know that is not not true. They really don't have anything to do with planets at all. But for better or worse, the name has stuck. Um, but the Owl Nebula uh, is um, formed when the star that is right here in the middle puffed up, blew away about half of its mass to form the object you see around it. Um, and it's about 2,000 light years away. It's a healthy distance, but still kind of on the close side compared to some other things we can see. 
Um, and uh, it, it is, again, a relatively faint, but definitely possible to see uh, by, with an amateur telescope, although not under light polluted skies. Definitely have to have at least uh, semi dark skies in order to see it. Uh, it's very low contrast, as you can kind of see. It, it's, it's not all that bright. Um, but why is it called the Owl Nebula? Uh, well, um, I have a picture to kind of illustrate this. Uh, so on the, the left, we have an image taken by a, a research telescope. Um, and on the right, we have an uh, image drawn by William Parsons, the third Earl of Ross, way back in 1848. Um, when he uh, sketched this, uh, this object by looking through his telescope, which was the largest in the world at the time, called the Leviathan, uh, really very large telescope for its time, but also by modern standards, kind of crude, not the greatest optical quality. Um, but just looking through the eyepiece uh, and then sketching on the paper what he saw, he saw what looked like to him kind of the face of an owl. Um, now, obviously, when you, uh, in that process, you know, looking and that under dim light conditions, something that's kind of hard to see, uh, and then uh, drawing it, things get kind of changed and shifted, just just the nature of it. Um, so he took, uh, I guess, some artistic liberties. Um, he, he has those two dimmer sections with two stars in them. But if you look at the image on the left, you can see those stars are actually not quite lined up. Um, but, you know, <laughs> a little lopsided, I guess. Uh, the pupils of the eye uh, got a little detached. Uh, but uh, uh, what he saw, William Parsons, was basically kind of an owl's face looking back at you uh, a little fuzzy but I, I, I like it i think it's kind of cute i always get a I get a, a hoot out of that picture but, um, uh, yeah i know i roll um <laughs> but uh, going back to the uh the live view here we can start to see in this view uh, i'm gonna adjust some settings just a little bit uh, i'm gonna adjust the contrast slightly if i can no, oh, just overshot it slightly. Um, we can see that color pretty well. Uh, it is a blue kind of teal color. Um, and you may even be able to spot there's some uh, background galaxy here as well. as another one up here. I have no idea how far away those are, but they're probably many millions of light years away. Um, but that color comes from uh, ionized oxygen atoms in the case of this bluish color, uh, whereas the red on the fringes is probably from hydrogen as well as maybe some nitrogen too. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a, uh, that blue color is common to see in planetary nebula. The oxygen was made in that star, most likely. And then as the star died, uh, outer layers expanded. Um, the heat of the dying central star excites those hydrogen, uh, oxygen, I should say, atoms to make them glow a particular teal color, which that reaction only happens in basically the vacuum of space. So it doesn't really happen here on, on Earth in our atmosphere. Uh, but uh, it is a common color to see because our eyes are actually very well adjusted to see it. Our eyes are most sensitive to blue and green light, uh, so that helps us perceive its color at night. But under dark adapted conditions, uh, we red light uh, stimulates our eyes the least. That's why astronomers often use red light to not destroy their night vision, your dark adaptation. Um, whereas blue light stimulates your eyes the most. So if you look at too much blue light at night, um, it will uh, force your eyes to adjust. Uh, it may actually even, under, if you have really bright blue lights, confuse your, your brain into thinking it's daytime and throw off your sleep, your sleep cycle. Um, that's why you often see uh, night lights and stuff marketed as a more amber color for that reason, to not disturb your circadian rhythm. All right, um, but that's the Owl Nebula. I think it's a, it's a fun one. Um, let us know if you if you buy that owl description. You know, does it look like an owl to you? Uh, you know, maybe the, the drawing I, I buy more than the real thing. It's a bit of a stretch. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm going to move on to our kind final of see it. Yeah, yeah, sort of, sort of. <laughs> yeah, so for our final object tonight, so 
We've seen many individual stars and the remnants of stars, or the areas they like to hang out with when they're born. But now we're going to see a lot of stars. And by a lot of stars, I mean a lot of stars. We're going to be looking at M81, Bode's Galaxy. Named after Joanne L. Ellert Bode, who found this on December 31st, 1774. This galaxy is about 12 million light years away from us, kind of near the constellation of Ursa Major. And for reference, one light year is about 6 trillion miles. So we usually get asked, what's the difference between a star cluster and a galaxy? So a star cluster has stars that are all formed around the same time, about the same age, and that's basically the main population of that cluster. And there's basically just stars and some planets thrown in here and there. For a galaxy, you have many more stars. Instead of a couple of thousands, you have billions of stars. And not only that, these are stars of many ages, many size differences, mass differences, and also lots of gas and dust in that galaxy as well. Kind of the rem remnants of stars and also giving birth to brand new stars. And there's usually a lot of activity going on. And this can actually be viewed with binoculars and small telescopes in suburban areas. It's, despite being that far away, it's still actually very bright. Just so many stars so, so close together. We can see that like from basically quintillions of miles away. So very, very, very big number. And actually, uh, how about we switch to the sky cam, Steven? See if sure. we have any improved luck on on there being yeah. any, any meteors. Yeah, still getting our image of M81 set up. But uh, yeah, there's our all sky camera view. Um, and waiting. maybe you'll get lucky and see a meteor or two while we're setting up the image. Um, almost ready, though. Nice. Okay. All right, so we have our image here of M81. I said that you two a second ago. M81. There is our live view coming in from our 16-inch telescope. Um, and yeah, this is a this is a really nice nice galaxy to look at. Um, it's visually pretty bright, uh, and it's got a lot of detail that you can make out, um, even at this great distance of 12 million light years. Um, so yeah, the M81 is uh, a spiral galaxy, and you can see the uh, spiral arms tracing out uh, from the center. We have one here, and then another one winding around the other side. So it's dominated by two large spiral arms. Um, some galaxies have more arms, some galaxies have less. Some of them are wound more tightly than others. Some of them are very loose. It's kind of in the middle. But uh, this, this galaxy definitely has a very bright central core to it. Um, very bright and the, the nucleus, as uh, an astronomer would call it. Um, and the, that galactic nucleus is uh, the middle, um, probably houses a very massive black hole as well as many, many stars surrounding it, too. But that black hole, uh, uh, most galaxies, vast majority of galaxies have large black holes at their center. But this one may be active. Uh, it may have stuff actively circling it, falling in, which tends to make centers of galaxies very bright. An astronomer would call an active galactic nucleus. Um, but uh, also, there are a great multitude of stars around the, uh, the middle of the galaxy. And you may notice that the center area is also kind of a yellowish color, uh, where, whereas uh, as opposed to a kind of blue color, which tells you that the stars in there are a little cooler and probably a little older. Uh, uh, but there's a lot of them. So although there are uh, many cool little stars, older stars in the middle um, because there are so many of them it's also still very bright um, whereas in the spiral arms as it's the exposure slowly lengthens you'll begin to see that uh, there are uh, many bluer stars uh, the blue stars being hotter 
younger, more massive, but also they're going to be more short lived. Uh, so, but they are typically found in the outer portions of the galaxy in the spiral arms. We'll also notice that near the middle of the galaxy, we have a band of dust and gas obscuring starlight. They have seen similar features in photos of the Milky Way, but it stands out pretty nicely here. We have some in our in our galaxy, but since we're viewing this galaxy from the outside, uh, we can appreciate that spiral uh, structure uh, better as well as the obscuring effect of the dust and gas silhouetted by the uh, the brighter mass at the at the middle. So again, this is M81, Bode's galaxy, about 12 million light years away. Uh, let's uh, put up a, another picture, a longer exposure photo of it, um, rotated around again as well, um, showing a bit better the colors there, as well as its satellite companion galaxy on the upper left called Holmberg 9. Fun fact about Holmberg 9, that little, that little puff on the upper left, it's one of the youngest galaxies we know of, uh, around 200 million years old, which for a galaxy is very, very young. Most galaxies are billions of years old, but uh, they got this little bitty one start just getting started. Uh, even this late in the universe's history, there may still be little galaxies uh, getting formed. So um, when we again, when we look at uh, a galaxy like this, uh, if we were to just view the individual stars of the galaxy, they would almost not be visible at this distance. It's only because there's so many, so many billions and billions of them, hundreds of billions, um, across such a huge scale, and this galaxy is 90,000 light years in diameter, um, that we appreciate it as a whole. Um, so individually, though, the stars may be pretty dim. Um, it's kind of like when you look at, uh, say, images of the Earth from above, from space at night, um, you see the giant cities, the metropolises of the world really stand out. And of course, if you were to look at just the individual sources of the light, uh, the individual bulbs, that may not seem like much, but it really adds up to great effect. Now, when we look at an uh, image, say, especially the Eastern half of the United States here, you can see that um, there are relatively few dark places left. Uh, even where it looks dark, you, if you drive out there, you'll still see those the major cities, especially many other smaller cities on the horizon. Um, but when you see light like this, of course, really the light is by definition kind of wasted. Uh, if you can see a, a light from space, that means that light isn't serving its purpose on the ground. Um, but out here in West Texas, it's still dark. Uh, this is an image taken from the International Space Station. Just looking out the window, from the cupola module of the, of the International Space Station. Um, and looking out the window, in this case, looking east, uh, you can see Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, Austin, uh, Houston, and, and even continuing on towards the horizon, you start to get some of Louisiana and beyond. And you can see how the eastern half is full of, of light. Uh, over in the West Texas area, closer in the bottom of the frame, we have Midland Odessa and the oil and gas fields of the Permian Basin. You can also see the oil and gas field of Eagle Ford Shale. Um, but here in near Fort Davis, it's still very dark. Um, and we're actually working with the oil and gas industry to help preserve our night sky, to use better lighting that keeps light on the ground to help preserve this dark corner you see on the lower right. And this dark corner on the lower right uh, is on a map, well, let's say uh, this portion of Texas, um, as well as northern Mexico. And recently, the International Dark Sky Association, the IDA, has, uh, grant, has certified this area as the Greater Big Bend International Dark Sky Reserve. Um, it's the largest of its kind in the world at over 15,000 square miles. And it's the first of its kind to be international, it's a cross uh, border agreement. Um, what does this really mean? Well, it means that everybody here, all the parks, the, the municipalities, the counties, have agreed to use better lighting practices. That means shielding lights, making sure they're aiming down where we actually need them, avoiding blue lights, preferring more of a amber color of light, um, only using the amount of light you need, and turning lights off when you don't need them.
just those four simple steps, they go a huge way into reducing uh, light pollution uh, pr and preserving our night sky as well as saving energy and money. So it's, it's just a win-win solution for everyone involved in this area. But this, uh, this reserve, uh, which was just certified earlier this month, um, is a result of years of effort from everyone in this region, not just McDonald Observatory, but Texas Parks and Wildlife, National Park Service, uh, CONAMP, which is the kind of MPS of Mexico, uh, as well as all the cities involved kind of have grouped together uh, to help preserve our night sky. Um, so this, I think, is a, an accomplishment that uh, we should celebrate. So we're having a party. We're having a party next week here at McDonald's Observatory, Dark Skies Fest on April 29th and 30th. That's Friday and Saturday next week. Uh, we'll have new exhibits uh, in our visitor center, tours, and talks, free, open during the daytime, uh, musical performances, and of course, star parties those nights. Reservations are required for the nighttime programs. Uh, you can make those reservations on our website but the daytime programs are free and open to everybody. So come out and see us and celebrate our night sky. Again, this is happening uh, next week, April 29th and 30th. Hope you guys can make it. Yeah, hopefully the y'all can make it out here at the very least, you know, try and enjoy some of the dark skies of your own. Yeah. All right, yeah, if you guys got any questions for us, uh, we, we're happy to answer them. Yeah, so I saw one here from Terry Jones. Are there any filters on the telescope? If so, what type of filters? Yeah, um, uh, there's just one filter. Um, it's called a UV IR filter. Uh, that's just filtering out infrared light uh, so it doesn't interfere, as well as ultraviolet light. Uh, the reason for that is because of my camera here, which emits re infrared light, which I can't see, but the camera could. So it would wash out the view if I didn't have that filter in. But basically, that means it's just seeing true color. That's all it means. Nice. Let's see. Let's see, that one was answered. I right, answer that one. Okay, from I am Rainstorm. Theoretically speaking, what's the hottest light bulb you could make before the glass would shatter? And what color <laughs> would it be? Uh, the hottest light bulb. Um, hmm. I got. Oh, you so know I, those. Mm. Yeah, those. Uh, old. This is old technology. Is arc lights. They would uh, basically just uh, pass an arc through two little filaments, and they would get crazy hot. Um, you know, insanely. I don't know exactly how hot, um, but they would. Uh, you know, if you leave them on too long, you could start melting, burning things. Um, uh, but but not nearly as hot as stars. Still, not even the hottest light bulb would be as hot as the some of the cooler stars we see. Yeah, I was actually trying to look that up earlier and couldn't find like a appropriate answer of when it will actually like explode from the heat, shatter from the heat. But yeah, they do get very very hot. Yeah, but yeah, some of them can get pretty hot. Yeah, no, but yeah, LEDs thankfully uh, don't really have that problem nearly as much. Uh, let's see what other ones by we feel free. So one that was earlier, I'm sorry if I'm botching a name, Brent Butchanan. It was that they live about 70 miles south of the observatory. Should their porch light, should they switch it for the lowest color temperature? What should it be done for their porch light? Yeah, um, generally just use the... Uh, uh... Uh, and make sure it's you know shielded and aimed down, and make sure it's uh, below 3,000 Kelvin or below 2,700 Kelvin on the temperature scale. That's uh, kind of a slightly yellowish amber. Um, if you you really want to preserve the sky, then yet uh, I mean you that's your priority. Then you can use even lower. Uh, but if you just use it intermittently and you're not uh, and you need to prioritize seeing things in 2,700 K. And then make sure it's it's shielded and turned off when you're not using it. Um, but yeah, simple steps. And if you ever encounter any uh, lighting concerns, I want to add you can uh, contact us. We're, we're happy to uh, to provide detailed advice and you know for your exact lighting situation as well. Nice. Yeah. Apart from that, let's see. Again, any other questions for us? Just let us know. 
Yeah, there's one from earlier about Hubble's variable nebula. If the star we see from SA cloud D, if the star we see in that is a protostar, the one that's illuminating the nebula. Uh, it's uh, debatable, but uh, it is very young. Um, I don't think it's quite a protostar, really. Um, it's probably a little bit later than that, um, but it is still very young. Let's see. Don't really see any other questions right now that the right. mods had not already answered. All right. Well, if that's the case, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Have a good International Dark Sky Week uh, this coming week. And uh, clear skies, everybody. Yeah. Clear skies. Thanks for joining us. And, hey, you can try to make clear skies of your own with the little tips we shared. Exactly. Good night, y'all. Good night.